Good evening, everyone. This is Gregory Peterson, and I'm happy to present this discussion on the explosion of the virtual concert. Tonight, we'll be discussing the origin of a new art form, the virtual choir, and how it came to be, the impact of COVID on virtual concerts, on professional musicians, and on community groups, and then we'll speculate on the future of virtual concert making. We'll be joined this evening by Eric Whitaker in a pre-recorded interview from Los Angeles, California. Eric is a composer, conductor, and the inventor of the virtual choir. We'll also be speaking with Jakob Josef Orlinski, a world famous countertenor, who has done significant work in virtual concerts. So the explosion of the virtual concert, why do I call it an explosion? <clears throat> well, the Dungan and Coral Society in Northern Ireland have put together a virtual concert. Here's their work. We have the Coral Giovanile Lavinium in Rome. They've done it. Then we can see the Rodean Girls School in South Africa. They've done a good virtual concert of their own. And this is the Seasons of Love presented by over 70 musical theater professionals from across Southeast Asia. They're doing it too. Um, and I can point out the University Glee Club of New York City, of which I'm a member, which produce a rather spectacular um, holiday concert, very inventive, creative, and actually opened my eyes to the idea that this is a whole new art form. We invited the So Harmoniums, which is a ladies group, to join us, and they did some incredibly inventive work in that concert. So what is a virtual concert? It's my definition. It's a musical video comprised of individually recorded performances blended digitally to create a whole ensemble work. How did this explosion come about? Well, here's some background in history. Why don't we go to the very, very beginning to Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville in France. His dates were 1817 to 1879. He invented a device called the phonotograph, patented in 1859. And there it is. That's a big plaster of Paris drum that a performer would speak into or sing into. And this is the very first recording of a song known to exist, recorded April 9th, 1860. Bear with me, it's a little scratchy. So that was the first song, but what about video? Thomas Alva Edison, tried marrying sound to film uh, with an invention called the kinetophone. This is the very first recording known of music on film. That didn't work out that well because only one person could see the video and hear it at the same time. But Lee DeForest, American inventor, developed an optical sound on film process called the phonofilm, later Vitaphone. <clears throat> and it has superior amplification, so professional musicians would be interested in it because they could have a real audience. This is the very, very oldest professional musical performance, or at least in oldest professional song that I could find from um, a, a film made by the Vitaphone Company uh, pre presented by Warner Brothers in 1926. It's Giovanni Martinelli. <laughs> Most people think that the first uh, sound on film was Al Jolson 
in The Jazz Singer, but that wasn't until a year later, 1927. He's so magnificent. Okay, let's get ahead to like the mid 20th century. At that time, people were making recordings pretty much the way they always had. They get together in the same location at the same time and all sing into the same mic or group of mics uh, to produce their music, which was recorded on one track. But then, Around 1954, Wikipedia says 1955, but it has to be earlier, um, multi-track recording was invented. It was also called MTR, or tracking. It's a method of sound recording developed that allows for the separate recordings of multiple sound sources or of sound sources recorded at different times to create a cohesive whole. So the first person who was known to take advantage of that was Peggy Lee, who recorded the number Sisters singing with herself. Lord, help the mister who comes between me and my sister. And Lord, help the sister who comes between me and my man. It was a marvel of its day. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. Well, we hadn't heard nothing yet because after that, nonlinear recording came along in the 80s and 90s, uh, and that was a means of recording digitally, um, which sort of rev revolutionized audio recording. And one artist who was taking advantage of that was... Natalie Cole, who sang with her fa father, who was not in the same place or the same lo location, because he had passed away. Uh, they happen to be distant cousins of mine. I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, so Frank Sinatra also sang duets with people who were in different places at different times. He had 23 famous artists recording duets with him in 1993. Uh, and uh, as I say, they were not in the same room, and it sort of sounded like it. So this brings us to the uh, 2000s and the invention of the virtual choir by this person, Eric Whitaker. He was a very well-known composer and conductor at the time. And um, at that time, with the advent of YouTube and smartphones, it occurred to him that he could invite individuals from around the world to submit their individual voices uh, recorded and to blend them together to create one piece of music. So this is from 2009. Uh, it's his first effort. It's got 185 voices, uh, f singers from 12 countries, a uh, piece called Looks Our Room Quay, and this is um, his first attempt.
that was his first attempt. And now um, his second video um, was produced shortly thereafter, 2,000 singers he had, and it is an incredible advance. <laughs> was just number two. Well, we've gotten now up to virtual choir number six. Eric has invited 17,572 singers from 129 countries. We won't have time to look at his most recent one. You can find it on YouTube. But it sort of looks like this. This is what it looks like when you have 17,000 people all together in one show. So, let me introduce you to Eric Whitaker. He hails from Reno, Nevada, studied music at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, received a master's degree in composition at Juilliard. He's gone on to have an illustrious career as a composer and conductor whose 2012 recording, Light and Gold, won a Grammy Award and became the number one record on the classical charts. His work has been performed by the London Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, among many other great musical organizations, and also, quite interestingly, at the Kennedy Space Center, where he collaborated on a piece for NASA. But we're here to speak with our guest tonight about the pioneering work he's forged as the creator of the Virtual Choir. Let us welcome our honored guest, Eric Whitaker. Thanks, Gregory. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. So we want to understand how you came up with the, 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 the art form, the virtual choir. Um, it must have been in your mind. How did it come to you? Explain what was on your mind. Were there precedents to doing this or did you come out of it? Did you come up with the whole idea for whole cloth? A, a pretty much whole cloth, I guess. This was way back in 2009 okay. and YouTube was still pretty young and we didn't all know what YouTube was. And a friend of mine had sent me a link to a video said, you've got to see this. And the video was this young woman there from Long Island, uh, just 17 years old, a woman named Britlin Losey. Yeah. And she had uploaded this fan video to me, mm -hmm. singing the soprano line to a piece that I'd written called Sleep. Yeah. And she basically just turned on the CD player behind her, played the recording, and then you could hear her sing over the top of it. But what was so unusual about it then, which is so ubiquitous now, is that it was she was looking directly into the camera. It was it was in her, I think in her living room, but you could see her piano in the background. It was just, it, it was very, very real and uh, very intimate in a way. And I remember watching her video and just being struck by the, by the intensity of it and the purity of her voice and, and the idea that she just sent this message out into the world like an electronic, um, you know, like an electronic message in a bottle and that it found me. <laughs> and I had this very simple idea, which was that if I could get say 25 people to do what Britlin was doing, if they just sang their part, soprano, alto, tenor, or bass, as long as they sang in the same tempo, same speed, and in the same key, they could do it anywhere, anytime, upload it all to YouTube. And my big plan was just to start all the videos at the same time, and then watch this choir unfold, this virtual choir. <clears throat> so that's, that's how it all started. Um, 
think you mentioned in, in some research I was doing that there was another YouTube um, music production, uh, Lollipop. Yeah, Lollipop actually came after our virtual choir. And and I remember at the time it was, they were calling it the world's largest virtual choir or something, which I guess technically it was, but um, yeah, I, I remember watching it and thinking, okay, it's super cool what they did, but they they really sort of went for low hanging fruit. Yes, exactly. You know, it was Lollipop, you know, this kind of thing. And, and so it, it was, yes, they were all there on screen together and making this thing. But, but what I loved about our first virtual choir is that it was, besides being just musically ambitious, it was poetically ambitious. Well, right. Also, it wasn't really a choir. I mean, they're all singing in unison, like when they're even really singing, but it's a fun thing to do. And I guess it, it brought people together in, in a unique way. Absolutely. Um, so you went on from that and I guess it was popular. You got a lot of uh, likes and a lot of uh, views. Yeah, it was the strangest thing. I really thought that only people you know, fellow choir geeks like myself and like you, Gregory, would, would even be interested in seeing something like this. And the video went viral, which was kind of a thrill. And then uh, we started getting contacted by um, international news media to do stories about it. And it was because of that, that then singers around the world started hearing about this thing mm -hmm. and contacting me over email at that time, very young Facebook. Uh, and saying, I don't know what this is, but I have to be a part of this. When is the next one? And this first one that we did had 185 singers from 12 countries, right. which at the time just seemed mind blowing to me that that far of a reach and that many singers. And it had never occurred to me that we would make another one. It was just a one-off experiment, but there were so many singers writing and so passionately that that's when we decided, okay, we'll make another one. And we've been making them for 10 years now. Right. Um so it seems like there's more going on than just the music in this, right? I mean, there's a sort of a community that you're building among these singers and people must have spoken to you about that as well. Yeah, that's, that's actually the, I think it's the great virtue of virtual choirs. As I said, we've been doing this now for 11 years, I guess. Um, and in that time, I think that, that the virtual choirs themselves are beautiful little works of art musically, but they're not really about the music. They're actually about these, this far flung connection and people's desire to find each other, mm -hmm. find their little tribes and, and connect. And over the years, we've had the most extraordinary stories. There's been, um, there was a man who in his teens, he'd been singing in choirs and had gone legally blind and had been unable to sing in a choir for over 30 years because he couldn't see the conductor. And then when the virtual choir came out, he was able to get close enough to the computer screen to see my little conductor track. He joined the virtual choir. There was a, a woman who, since she was a young woman, had sung with her mother in, in choirs. It just been this tradition that they had together. And her mother was dying of cancer in hospice. And so she recorded her video holding her mother's hand just off screen as a timeless tribute. I find that so beautiful. Wow. And there was a, a man from Cuba who desperately wanted to join the virtual choir, but because of government regulations at the time, couldn't send us an email with an attachment larger than one meg. Mm -hmm. So we got our tech team together with him and he cut it into 26 little one meg files, sent it over to us, we stitched it together. Cuba became part of the virtual choir. And so, so more than just the musical experience, it's, it's this, um, uh, it's just a, a beautiful, a uh, capture of the human spirit and and how how deeply people want to connect with each other. Um, <clears throat> well, let me offer that um, my choir, the University Glee Club, we've got about 80 singers, basically. A video holding her mother's hand just off screen as a timeless tribute. I find that so beautiful. Wow. And there was a, a man from Cuba who desperately wanted to join the virtual choir, but because of government regulations at the time, couldn't send us an email with an attachment larger than one meg. Mm -hmm. So we got our tech team together with him and he cut it into 26 little one meg files, sent it over to us, we stitched it together. Cuba became part of the virtual choir. And so, so more than just the musical experience, it's, it's this, um, uh, it's just a, a beautiful uh, capture of the human spirit and, and how, how deeply people want to connect with each other. 
Um, <clears throat> well, let me offer that um, my choir, the University Glee Club, we've got about 80 singers basically on a stage at a time. But since COVID occurred, we've been rehearsing virtually and put together a really great performance uh, for a Christmas show. But we were able to include people who were not able to get to New York and they were able to be in the show yes. and really participate, be part of the group. Um, I was very skeptical about performing in a virtual choir. I thought it'd be really a boring waste of time. And I went to the first rehearsal and there were like 75 people who showed up. <laughs> yeah. I said, wow, people really want to do this. Yeah. So I just pitched in and uh, we turned out one of the best performances that I've ever seen in this genre, Fantastic. which I'll be happy to send uh, uh, you a clip if you'd like to see it. Please, please, I would love um, to. I actually thought it was a, a, an advance in the art form and it sort of got me uh, interested in learning more about it and having this conversation with you. Wow, yeah, I have to see it, definitely. Um, so let me ask you, what are the technological advances that led up to this? I mean, I, it didn't come out of thin air. I mean, you, you had technical assistance to put the first one together. Um, yeah, that's right. How do you arrange all of that? Where do all of these videos reside? So that's what, funnily enough, we're basically using the same technique and probably the same technique you used when you made yours that we were more or less using in 2009. The equipment has gotten somewhat better, the computers and digital editing. What's definitely gotten better is everyone's cameras and microphones. You can imagine back in 2009 when we made that first one, it was still kind of a rare thing to have a working camera. And you definitely, having a smartphone was unusual. And, and, and now everybody has a smartphone with right. phenomenal yeah. cameras. And, and so, yeah, right. So what we're getting uh, on our end now is a production level that is tenfold over, over what we had before. It's really a, a quantum leap. The, the, the real advances though for us has been the, the development of the internet and that now we've built out a website that what we used to do when we started was everybody just upload it to YouTube and tag yourself and then we'll find your video and make it from there. Mm. But now we've got our own, uh, our own server and even our, our own architecture on, on my website to capture all of these videos so they all have the same codex and that they're all the same size and shape and speed and that the sound is better that way as well. So it's, it's in the capturing and building of the community that, that, we, that you can really see the technological advances. So you have someone, I mean, you're a musician. I'm sure you're not the guy who's turning all the knobs to put these things together. Who, who are your crew? Yeah, so, well, as it turns out, I'm a, I'm a bit of a tech nerd. I always have been, so I'm doing a little bit of it. Um, but the, the main crew, there's three different crews and, and you'll get a kick out of this. The, the, the web team is a guy named Damien Dutois, and then he's got some people working for him. He's in South Africa. Damien and I have been working together for almost 15 years. He designs all of my websites. I've only met him once in person. Can you imagine? It's, it just speaks to this crazy interconnected world we live in. Um, and then both the audio team and the video team are in London. So all of the meetings that I had with everybody, especially during this last one that we did during the pandemic, mm -hmm. were it's everything is remote and we're on time zones, you know, up and down. Right. Um, and you're in what, LA, right? In Los Angeles, that's right. Yeah, and so, so the audio team has just four people on it. Although this time around, this latest one that we did was so big that we needed real help. And so we had students, interns who were helping just go through all of the audio files and all the video files. And then the video team was five people. And then there's two executive producers who must be named, Claire yeah. Long and Meg Davies. Lovely because way. yeah, with, without the two of them, they are the beating heart, they're the brains, they're the lungs, they're the soul of the virtual choir. It's, it just wouldn't exist if it weren't for the two of them. How long does it take you to put one of these things together? As long as we have. <laughs> Do you have deadlines or? Yeah, we, what we've learned over the years, <clears throat> and I wonder if it was this, this way when you made yours, is that <laughs> singers especially, singers simply procrastinate. I don't know if it's built into the singer's DNA, but if, 
if the deadline for submitting a video is May 1st at 1159 PM, half of those videos will come in in the last 10 minutes. And what we had in several virtual choirs previous was that we would crash the servers because so many singers would try to upload their videos at the last possible minute. Right. So, so what we realized is by actually condensing the, the amount of time that you could submit videos, it forced singers to, to procrastinate less mm -hmm. and we had a much better result. Mm -hmm. So the, the last one that we did, I would say from the moment I started writing the piece to the premiere was probably four months, which felt it sound like quick. a very long time. Yeah, in, in our world, it felt like we hit the ground running and we're sprinting the entire time. And what about the visuals? So because some of the visuals are so extraordinary Thank in you. your works. I mean, even, I mean, the first one, okay, that was a nice, it was odd, it was different. It looked like a lot of people, it was, it was fine. The second one, it's just a marvel to, to behold. And <laughs> you keep getting more and more inventive as we've gone along. Uh, so who is designing it? That's, we all do it together. Um, I certainly won't take credit for it completely, but I, I usually come to the table with some, some pretty specific ideas. And then the team of filmmakers are amazing. I mean, they're the real artisans and they, they find the, the look, the feel. And then, then it's just lots and lots of meetings where we're, we're sharing ideas and talking back and forth until we kind of find, all right, here's, here's what we'll do. And, and here's the direction we go forward. Okay, what about um, funding? Where does it <laughs> come? Because these things look expensive to me. Yeah, they are very, very expensive. I, I can tell you that the past several of them have been in the hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Oh my God. And we made, there's a few principles that we are holding fast to from the beginning all the way through. And the first is that, unrelated to money, that every single singer gets in, no matter what. If they, if they sing badly, then we have the advantage of having so many singers that actually the, the, the rough edges get smoothed out. Mm -hmm. um, but we've never turned a single person away. Uh, and that's singers as young as three, as old as 103, from 145 different countries over the six virtual choirs, um, every race, creed, color. So we've tried to be as inclusive as possible. That's the first principle. The yeah. second one is that we will not commercialize it. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine when you see those visuals, how many corporations have contacted us saying, this is exactly what we're looking for. This sums up, you know, the right. message that we want for the world. Um, it's, it's a very compelling selling tool, I would imagine. And we've said no to everybody. We've also said no to some, some of the biggest pop stars in the world who wanted to collaborate or, or have one of their pieces turned into a virtual choir. Mm -hmm. That's just not what we're doing. And so every one of these has been funding that has been donated. We've done a couple of Kickstarter campaigns. This last one was generous gifts from private donors or from the Colburn School or um, uh, Hal Leonard, the, the music company, Distinguished Concerts International New York has given money. So uh, just very, very generous individuals and, and arts organizations. Uh, okay, now you know what? I'm a lawyer, so I'm just going to ask. You don't have to go really go with it. Are there legal issues? I mean, you're, <laughs> copy, you're copywriting this, but, but what is it that you're copywriting? You, do you have releases from people? I mean, you think that if they submit this stuff, you don't need to get them to sign a paper, but do they sign a paper? Well, it's, it's, you're a lawyer, so you'll you'll understand this completely. Is that that they do sign a paper, basically giving us rights to use their image and yeah. and the music with the with the virtual choir. But being a lawyer, you know that that's at best only going to hold up anyway in the United States. We have 145 countries, oh, right. Right. right? So I'm not sure what the agreement looks like that covers all of those territories and countries, but it's definitely not what we've got. So, you know, we do our best. And so, so far, we haven't had any issues at all. But I will say that back in 2014, 13 or 14, we made a virtual choir with Disney. And... And it was for the parks and it was a very special thing. It was different from these mage, these main virtual choirs we do. But initially it was going to be open to everyone. And by the time Disney's legal team got done with it, it could only be in the contiguous United States and the singers must be 18 or over. And I remember thinking, okay, there's, yeah, so there's the, there's the legal version we're doing. And then there's, 
There's the right. bulletproof legal version that Disney is doing. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so Liz, I wanted to ask, how have you seen uh, the art form evolve since the advent of COVID? Ah. Now, um, your choir, I mean, you just came out with one, well, in 2020, right? So um, the most recent one you did, uh, what was it? It was um, Sing Gently, right? 17,572 right. voices from 129 countries, right? Yes. Yes. And I guess there's nothing to keep you from doing the same thing during COVID, but how have you seen the form? Of, what have you seen other people doing? Do you have different ideas? Um, do oh, you yeah. More interest in your work because of COVID? How does that? Well, what's interesting is before COVID, no one was making them. You can imagine everybody would also, they're, you've been a part of one. They're not easy. They're, they're really difficult, not only for the individual members, but for the people on the, on the back end who are making them. They're right. not easy to do. So no one was really doing them. And then you use the word evolve during the time. It was less an evolve evolution and just more an explosion. It mm -hmm. was that the pandemic happened. And then I think we all went into the fetal position in the arts community, just saying, right. <laughs> and especially singers, right? You remember those first days when when it became clear that it was dangerous to sing together, that we were super spreaders. Exactly. Right, and the entire global singing community, millions and millions of people, I think all just were curled up in a ball saying, oh my God, what is this? And then like everyone else, everyone stood up and dusted themselves off and said, okay, what can we do? And so within a month or two, we were getting hundreds of emails a day from choirs all over the world saying, how do you make these things? Mm. And <clears throat> so it was, it was as if no one was making them and then, everybody was making them right it, which is just thrilling to see it happen yeah the, now the artistic evolution like you were saying you've been doing really interesting things i can't wait to see what you've done some of the virtual choirs or orchestras or bands or musical theater uh virtual mu musical theater performances i've seen have just been mind-blowing where people are taking the form and saying you know you could do this you could do this you could push the technology this way or that way mm -hmm. uh, it's just extraordinary to me uh well, yeah, how, how people by saying, are. look, your work is sort of like performance art, <clears throat> and it's somewhat about the music, but more about you know the whole um, community that you've built and the look of it and the technology behind it. And the music is a smaller part. But what I've seen since COVID is that people want to make music, and they have to come together that way in order for the music to come apart, come together. And um, I'm going to be showing um, a, a clip of um, the King Singers with uh, Yosef, mm. um, Jakob Joseph Orlinski doing a piece which I came across and I was stunned because I just thought it was some college a cappella group <laughs> because everybody's dressed in t-shirts and you know chains and their hair's not done. And I thought, oh, who are these people? And then the music was outstanding. And it wasn't for weeks before I figured out it was the King Singers, because <laughs> that's the way they had to pre you know, present themselves. And so any number of groups are now really focusing on the music as well as the techn technological part, or maybe even downplaying the technological part. Mm. Um, so I've, I've just been fascinated by this. I, I guess you've been following it as well. Yeah, as much as I can, but like, there's just thousands there's so and thousands of, of them. Yeah, right, it's extraordinary. Right. Um, so do you have plans for another one coming up, another virtual? Will it be the same type of thing? Are you going to try to, try to get, you know, like 30,000 people the next time? Oh, I mean, the 17,000 people are sort of like four times the population of Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> a great Apple. statistic. <laughs> um, you know, I laughed too when you first asked, started ask, asking the question because every single time we finished a virtual choir, we always have this this post mortem meeting and say never again. That that is that's drained all the life force from it. Let's never do this again. And then, you know, a, a year later, well, I've got this idea. And so the same thing happened after this one, and and this one was this this one provided some challenges. You know, you mentioned thirty thousand people that we didn't expect to come up against. It's, for instance, uh, even on a 4K screen, which most people don't have a massive 4K computer monitor. Mm -hmm. if, if you wanna have every single person on screen like we did, right. to get 17,500 
572 singers on there, you can only dedicate 23 pixels per person. So the final hero shot where you've got everybody, we're this close to running out of pixels on a 4K right. screen. And there was a moment when, we, just to make sure that the render had gone well, the screens in the studio weren't big enough. So Claire and Meg, the executive producers, rented out a theater in London and had it projected on a giant movie screen so that they could sit there with a yellow notepad and say, okay, frame 420, there's a problem in the left-hand corner. Wow. So if we go much bigger than we went last time, we're starting to run into technical issues that, that actually we don't have solutions for, right. at least in terms of the way we do it now. Right, well, I also noticed it's like, three minutes of the singing and then the credits go on for like seven minutes because you have to get everybody's name up. That's right, yeah, we include every single name every time. And, and the, 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 like you say, the, the names are longer than the movie itself. Um, what I'm hoping will happen, I'm hoping I'll have a, a bit of a lightning bolt somewhere here and say, okay, instead of doing the way we've been doing it, what if we tried this? Something just a little different or maybe using technology in a slightly different way. I, I can feel it bubbling below the surface. I'm not sure what that thing is yet, but mm -hmm. there's some promising technologies floating around. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what I'm super interested in, right. is seeing where we could take, take the art form technologically. You know, um, apparently there's some new technique where people can all sing together on, online. Mm. But it would be wild if you had 20,000 people singing at the same time. Precisely. This is, I've actually been working with a company called Jack Trip that does this very oh. thing where if you're within 400 miles of each other, you can basically sing with zero latency. Um, right. But yeah, and then, then you, you come up with other technological issues, which is that's only audio. So if you want somebody to follow a conductor track, then as conductor, you have to learn how to conduct several seconds ahead of the singers. Right which sounds crazy when I say it out loud, but then orchestras have been doing this for almost two centuries where the, the conductor is slightly ahead of the orchestra right. and everyone has just learned how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So it might just be the, the, you know, the first steps of a new, of a new genre, we'll see. So um, virtual choir notwithstanding, you have composed beautiful music and I've actually had the honor of singing some of it. Have you really? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm wondering, when are we going to get to hear a live performance of Eric Whittaker's work again? Uh, the moment it is safe. The moment it is safe. I, I don't know about you, Gregory, but I am aching in my bones to, to make live music again. I miss it so much. Um, well, I miss making it and I miss seeing it. I live a 10-minute walk from the Metropolitan Opera House, uh, wherever I pass that place. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. That's it. Um, and so, so I imagine whatever the first several rehearsals and performances I do, I think I'm, I'm just going to be a mess. I think I'll be in tears the entire time. Um, yeah, really, truly the moment it is safe for, for everybody. I'll, I'll be back with a group of musicians making music somewhere. But I heard something about November in New York. Is that possible? Yeah, there's a concert in the calendar right now, New York in Carnegie Hall. So fingers, fingers crossed. Um, yeah, it's, I, I guess we'll have to see how effective the vaccines are, what kind of variants uh, are circulating, how, how many people are actually taking the vaccines. I imagine it'll still be some, ver some hybrid version for quite a while of vaccines and masks and social distancing. Um, but whatever it is, I'll be there. If it's, if it's safe, I'll be there. Great, great. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to your next virtual performances and live performances. And I can't thank you enough for your time, Eric. It's really, really generous of you no, to it's... share your moment with us at Columbia, with Lily Club. Really appreciate it. It's truly my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing this, Gregory. We all know how serious it can be when singing groups get together in the same place and rehearse and perform uh, their music. This is a photograph of the Amsterdam Mixed Choir, which on March 8th of last year gave a performance of Bach's St. John's Passion at the Concertgebouw Auditorium in Amsterdam. Unfortunately, 100 people in that group uh, fell ill and um, 
three or four associated individuals uh, died from COVID uh, from that one earth-shaking super spreader event. Uh, performances around the world, of course, stopped right after that. But the Metropolitan Opera sprung to life and it um, created its first ever virtual performance. And you're about to hear a very touching performance of the intermezzo from Cavalleria Rusticana performed by the Met Opera at its at-home gala given on April 25th last year. What a touching performance. Sadly, many of the performers you saw in that video may not uh, be able to rejoin the Metropolitan Orchestra when it begins its new season. So it's the last time they will be performing together in this video. But now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Jakob Josef Orlinski. We're lucky indeed to have him with us tonight in a pre-recorded uh, interview I did with him a short time ago. He is one of the most important new stars on the world operatic stage. Countertenor Orlinski is a Juilliard grad and winner of the grand finals in the Metropolitan Opera's National Council Vocal Competition 2016 and indeed of many other vocal um, competitions, vocal awards. He was catapulted to international stardom by his viral performance of a Vivaldi aria three years ago. Jakob is scheduled to make his Met Opera debut next season in the new opera, Yuri Dis. Uh, by the way, Jakob is also a prize-winning breakdancer. <laughs> Jakob has made a significant contribution to the art of virtual singing. We'll now see him in a surprise recording he made with the redoubtable English ensemble, The King's Singers. This is how they normally present themselves uh, in their suits and ties until their um, virtual performances this year. You can see they were all at home in their uh, various towns around England when they made the recordings. Um, so let's enjoy them singing with Jakob in Henry Purcell's Music for a While.
So thank you. Thanks so much, Jakob, for joining us this evening. No, I'm, I'm um, very, very happy to be with you, all of you guys. Where are you, where are you situated today? I am uh, in Warsaw, in my hometown. And how long have you, ha have you had to stay there through the pandemic? Yeah, I'm basically here since March 2020, but I've been traveling a little bit. I've been in Paris and I've been in... Uh, in Madrid, so I've been in few places to 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 do some sort of work. Right, but needless to say, you were not together with the King Singers when you did this uh, terrific. Definitely, performance. definitely not. Can you tell us how that came about and what your experience was like? Actually, it started way before. I think it started in 2019 when I was singing with Il Pomodoro with an uh, orchestra, uh, my uh, solo repertoire from my album. And I was singing in France on a festival and I saw uh, on the poster that like two days later, 
the King Singers are going to sing. And I am obsessed with the King Singers because I grew up on, on that uh, ensemble. So I was, I, I made a, a story on Instagram saying like, wow, I'm super happy that I'm singing on the same festival as uh, the King Singers. And it's a huge honor for me. And they contacted me. They just uh, started writing to me and, and they said, maybe we should do something together someday. And then there was silence for many, many, many months. And then uh, actually when the pandemic started, uh, they emailed me and they said like, hey, we want to do something like, like that, like a remote sort of video. And I was really, really blown away sort of because it's more than a dream coming true. So uh, they asked me to send them like a list of arias or pieces that I would love to, to, to do with them so that they could choose something that would be suitable for, for their sound, for their uh, ensemble. So they chose from my quite long list um, music for a while, and uh, and I think it was a it was a good choice. Great. Did, when so when you made the recording, um, what sort of equipment did you use? Did everyone get microphones sent over, or did you have no? I mean, it is it is you very complicated. Them? It is it is very complicated uh, because you know the thing is that there there are a lot of a lot of things that are happening right now. Like everybody's recording, they are using their iPhones, they are using some sort of like, I don't know, computer microphones and the quality is sometimes not really good. And if you do something and you put it on the internet, you have to be aware that it's gonna stay forever. Even if you put it for just like one day and you delete it, like it never disappears. Like somebody already downloaded it. So it is very important for artists and actually crucial to take care of the quality like you want to be sure that the quality is good so of course mm, i didn't have the best conditions to record that but i have a friend who actually has uh, microphones for his piano so i recorded my vocal uh, part on the piano sort of dedicated for piano um, mics so it was quite interesting it's not a big big um, problem to record on some some like microphones like that but it was not really comfortable because um, the thing is that in order to to be able for their because they they were also recording separately and they have a sound engineer who asked us to record in the driest acoustics ever like you just have to cover yourself basically with the with the i don't know some kind of uh, blanket or something just to make the acoustic as dry as possible so that he can actually match our voices and put those all of those voices in one room. Uh, because otherwise, if I would record it in, for example, my apartment, it has uh, such an acoustic like, like this and somebody would record in a bathroom and it has a totally different acoustic, uh, it would be very difficult to put those, those uh, voices together. What about the conducting? How did you you know, figure out the tempi and the mood. Was there a so watch? I, I know the piece very well. So we had some Zoom calls. We had actually two Zoom calls to kind of get to know each other and to talk about the interpretation. And the, they sent me the score of the arrangement. And the arrangement is actually done by one of the one of the King singers, Nick Ashby. Um, and it's a very, very good arrangement. Uh, so they recorded because I, I have this sort of melody line with the lyrics. Mm, so I was the last one to record. So they recorded, I believe they recorded from the bass line, which is this basso stinato sort of thing, mm, which repeats. And then they were adding voices one by one. Mm, and it's basically you have to know exactly in which places we are going to slow down a little bit and in general you have to sort of keep the tempo in order to have the the everything um, together so i was the last one to record so so i was the last one to, to to record so i had the sort of easiest job because i already had the whole track and i just put it in and then I record it on top of on top of that. Well, yeah. Speaking of it, how long did it take for the entire thing to be uh, recorded and put together? I mean, I think it took us like two months to do everything with all the formalities and. Um, so what about the wardrobe? And normally, when I've seen the King Singers, they've been dressed up in suits. Who decided that it was going to be t-shirts and 
you know yeah no because we decided that it has to be sort of casual like it's it's not a situation from home to suddenly be in a in a in a suit or like tuxedo so i said guys let's let's do it like casually let's let's just do it in a i wanted to just put maybe a jacket but they said no a t-shirt is fine like anyways it's a small sort of you know frame and there are seven of us so it's going to be you know it's going to be nice so we decided to put it as easy and as sort of the the the, the sort of like very very casually looking so how what sort of reaction did you get from this video did you did it help you keep in touch with your fans did did it help you um keep your professional contacts uh, um alive I mean, it was a very good experience and very good thing for my career. I mean, to do something with the King Singers, I always dreamt about something like that. And uh, and for my public, for my fans, it was something unexpected and uh, and very sort of like a little Christmas gift, even though it was not Christmas. But you know, yeah. it's well for. I, I hope that you know you get back to the stage real fast and that you won't need yeah. to do virtual. Um, performances, but this one was so good. I hope that you will continue to do them with the King Singers and with other people. Well, it turns out that recording yourself and sending it into some central technician to be merged into a virtual concert with others is not the only way to come up with a virtual concert these days. Um, this is green screen technology. You're probably familiar with it. Uh, that's where a performer is taped in front of a green background, and that image is isolated and placed in, in front of another background. It makes them appear someplace that they are not. Well, um, you can see that professionally done on the Colbert Show every night. This is his band, Stay Human. Uh, recording their bumper, and none of these people are in the studio at the same time. Well, community groups is all, have also taken up this technology. This is the Rexburg Children's Choir in Rexburg, Idaho, performing a number in which the children all showed up individually, record their parts, and then the um, the isolated images were put together to make it look like they were in the same room. Totally amazing. Well, what are the advantages for community groups in having virtual concerts? Well, besides the health benefits, of course, there's inclusive, it's inclusive of community members despite space, time, disability. It permits views of friends and colleagues in their private settings, or it can, so you're not just seeing them all in suits looking uniform, get to know them a little better. Uh, it can be produced over longer periods of time if there are people who cannot be at the performance venue the night of a scheduled performance. And as, as mentioned, it's germ-free. We've got our own virtual concert makers here at the Columbia Kingsmen, our undergrad uh, group. And we've even got an alumni group, the Columbia alum alumni singers who have all um, presented virtual concerts. So what does the future hold? Well, you can never know what's ahead in the future, but I can tell you what's happening right now. Um, there is a new type of virtual music making uh, called the collab performance. Uh, what happens is that a performer puts his song up on TikTok and then people viewing his song, getting into it, all around the world, whoever they are, they've never met him, but they can take that image and they can add their own musical line to his song. This guy, Nathan Evans, Evans performed 
a sea chanty called the Wellerman that was extremely popular in TikTok. And people joined in and it became a viral uh, video. So let's take a look at that. It's a lot of fun. Was a ship that put to sea. The name of the ship was a belly of tea. The winds blew up her bow. The down below my belly boys blow. Soon may the little man come to bring the sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Soon may the little man come to bring the sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. She had not been two weeks from shore and down on her right well bore. The captain called all hands and swore he'd take that whale and go. Such an infectious tune. Well, when you go up on TikTok, you never know who is going to join in with you. And believe it or not, take a look. This is Andrew Lloyd Webber, who joined in on this particular TikTok. Well, thank you very much for joining me with this presentation. Uh, and I hope to be able to join you again with Columbia Alumni Association Arts Access. Good night.